All right, so what we will do tonight is corporate investment and finance decisions and introduction to that. The, we will cover the financial goal of the corporation and then we'll have an intro into financial statements. Financial ratios will not be covered in this lecture. It will be covered in a lecture, the next lecture, but then it will be combined with introduction into uh, the calculation of present value, future, future values and so forth. So what essentially is financial management? So financial management um, could be defined as the management of finances to achieve an entity's financial objectives. Uh, in For profit entities, this is usually to maximize the value of the firm. A narrow view is to maximize stockholders' wealth. All right. So when we say the maximum the value of the firm is that when we, when we look at the firm, the value of a firm is what uh, someone who has no relation to a company, so what we call an arm's length transaction, will pay for that company, right? The narrow view correlates to the company operating in a way that would maximize the shares value that a stockholder, shareholder will have in a particular entity. But would it be different for not-for-profit entities? How do you think um, not-for-profit entities would, would look at financial management? What are some of the things that they will try to achieve? And you're free to answer. No one wants to answer? All right, so principally for not-for-profit entities, they look, they look at more things like social causes. So, and then they don't normally have shareholders, right? So what they'll try to do is maximize their, the positive social impact they'll have in society. So that will include things like looking at, um, you know, care of the environment, things looking like, um, let's say like the YMCA, you know, they look at providing safe spaces for, for young people um, to engage in art, sports, whatever. And then of course, there are other things that look at like the less fortunate. So in our case here, if you look at the Dharamsala, which is a home to those who don't have a home, um, then they're, financial management, while they, they will focus on meeting their expenses and so forth, but they don't, they would not have a target or an objective of maximizing the value of the entity that they run. So if we look at the big picture now, um, so in financial management, in trying to maximizing the value of the firm, a couple of things or some big silos of decisions have to be taken. So first there's the investment decision. So the investment decision essentially says where you will invest, which market you will invest, which industry you will invest in, what type of business you will invest in. So that's the first decision you take when you look at the big pitch in financial management. Then there's the financing decision. So having decided what kind of business, what industry you want to invest in, then you have to say, well, okay, where do I find the finances from? Do I go for debt? Do I go for equity? Do I use, if the company is a company is already in operation, do I use the equity that I have in the business? Uh, that, that's the profits to reinvest. So you decide the finance, on that financing decision. You also decide on the mix of it. Do I go 100% equity or 100% debt? Or do I mix it? And then how do I mix it? And then after having done that, and you would have gone, made the investment, decided on how you're gonna finance that investment. After a period of operation, those persons who would have invested it, and especially, so dividends relates to equity holders. So equity holders are shareholders, right? Those equity holders now will look for a return on their profits, on their investment, sorry. 
So there are two kinds of returns that equity holders normally have. So there's one that is dividends. So dividends, money that, uh, that the board will propose to the, to the shareholders at a general meeting to say, well, okay, this is the amount of money we want to return to the shareholders. And this is the money that is, uh, the dividend is that amount of money that is taken out of profits to repay shareholders for their investment. So that's one part of, um, so the company and the managers of that company will have to decide how much, what is the dividends policy, how much of the profits they will return to the, to the shareholders. Right, and of course, how much they return to the shareholders will also have a bearing on, you know, future investments, um, you know, um, coming bills that they'll have to pay, other bills. So that will heavily influence the dividend or what we call payout decision. And as I mentioned, dividend is only part of the returns that shareholders will get on their investment. The other part of the return is the appreciation in their shares value. So for instance, if we have a sharehold, if we have a company that would have sold shares to shareholders at let's say $100 per share, and then at the end of the year, that share is valued at $120. From the shareholders um, point of view, then they have a, what you call a capital appreciation in that equity, in, in that equity holding of 20%, because you'll have, the share would have moved from $100 when they bought it to $120 now. So if they sell the shares immediately, they will get a return of $20. So, and if in that particular year or two, they are paid a dividend, let's say another dividend of $8 per share. So they would have gotten, if they would have sold the share at the end of the year, collected the dividends paid, they would have gotten $128 on that $100 that they would have invested. So their total return would have been $28 or 28%, but it would have been made up of two aspects, a capital appreciation of $20 and a dividend of $8. So always remember, shareholders, when they invest in companies, there is two aspects to the return that they will receive. One, in the case when the share prices go up, capital appreciation or the share price appreciation. And whenever dividends is paid, right, the dividend per share that is paid. And then when we look at financial management, there's also the risk management decision. So having taken the investment, then you have to manage the risk. So in, the, in, in risk management, some of the things that you do, or some of the things that I'll just touch briefly on it, will include whether you take insurance. So if you're gonna build, construct a new building, then do you take out insurance? Um, of course, if you borrow from banks now, yes, they do. But if shareholders, for instance, uh, would have financed the complete construction, then they might not be, a, you know, they might not ask you to do, to take out insurance um, as rigid as the bank will do. But yes, you can decide on that. You can decide uh, in terms of risk management, uh, where you invest the money, right? So if you're gonna do overseas investment, uh, you know, what currency you want to do your business in. So if you're a Guyanese company and you're doing business with a, uh, let's say a US company, you know, part of your risk management decision is to decide which currency that you, you would wish to do uh, business in so that you could protect yourself from things such as movement in the exchange rate. So those are just two broad risk management techniques that a company could, could consider as part of the financial management uh, strategy or financial management of the company. So just to recap this particular slide, which is very critical to financial management. So you have the investment decision all right, so decide in which assets you're going to invest in, whether it's physical assets or whether it's financial assets. You have the financing decision, which says where the money is coming from. So whether you take debt or equity, you have the dividend payout decision, which will say how much of the profits you make you return to the shareholders. And then there's a risk management decision, which says how do you uh, protect the investments that you would have made from downside movements. 
So corporate decision and finance, uh, corporate investment and financing decisions. So principally in corporate investment, you invest in real assets. So real assets are those that you use to produce goods and services. So in the case of, let's say, uh, then more manufacturers who manufacture um, clothing, then the real assets that they'll invest in is things like their um, industrial sewing machines, um, whatever lifting equipment that they will have. Um, let's say in the, if in the case of um, power plants, you know, you'll invest in things such as cranes, you invest in things such as engines. So those are the real assets that will produce uh, goods and services. That's what capital investment covers. So you can either invest in real assets or you can also invest in uh, financial assets. So you, so you can have some money and you can decide whether you want to buy shares in a company. So that also is, is a corporate investment that companies make. Once you would have invested in real assets though, then you have financial claims to the income generated by the firm's real assets. So let's say you would have invested uh, and borrowed money to finance the purchase of, uh, let's say engines um, to manufacture or to generate electricity, then you will create a financial asset for someone, the bank for instance, who will now then have a claim on whatever income that you generate from those real assets um, to repay them. Then you have, so the investment decision is the purchase, is the purchase of, of real assets. And then the financing decision is the sale of financial assets. So once, once you decide to go in a particular stream of business, then the investment decision is how much of a real asset, how much of a real assets, what type of real assets you're gonna, gonna purchase, uh, what technology you're gonna purchase those real assets with. And then the financing decision is what kind of stake you will sell in, in the company to finance those that investment decision. So do we go to, to a bank and have debt or do we ask um, financiers to take equity interest in a particular company? Any questions? Any questions? No, sir. sir. So investment decisions, which we can also call capital budgeting decisions. It says it's in a decision to invest in tangible or intangible assets. Again, you could, tangible assets are the one you can feel. Intangible assets are things such as uh, trademarks, um, computer software, things that you can't feel, right? Capital budgeting or investment decision is also called the invest, the is also called capital expenditure, or in corporate circles, they call it capex decisions. So these are all synonymous. So investment decision, capital budgeting decision, or capex or capital expenditure are, are things that are all of the same. So when once you hear those um, those terms, you will know that they're associated with with the investment decision of financial management. This table that is taken directly from the text shows an example of some of the recent investment and financing decision by major public corporations. And these are really major public corporations. You'll see that Dan is really getting famous. So second on the list, you'll see that ExxonMobil would have reinvested 8.5 billion of cash that is from operations. Here, ExxonMobil recognized that there is a that there is a investment opportunity in Guyana, and they decide to finance that by the money, the cash that they have in hand. So instead of returning that 
5 billion to the equity holders, the shareholders, they have decided that they'll, re they'll reinvest that money in a new opportunity. So here is an example of an investment decision, which is to pursue oil fields in, in Guyana. And then the financing decision, they're using the cash that they have on, in, on hand to reinvest in, that, in those oil fields here in Guyana. If you go down the list, they have some more, and you see there's some differences in how the, the financing is done. So for the first one, um, which, I wouldn't, which I wouldn't attempt, but a company out of the Netherlands, they've invested 1.4 billion in supermarkets in the US and Europe. And they've decided to finance that by a 1 billion share purchase, repurchase program. So what they did is to go back to the shareholders that they have and repurchase their shares. So in that, in that instance, what they do is to reduce the amount of shareholders that they have. And in some cases they will offer to the existing shareholders maybe additional shares. But what, they, what their main aim there at financing that particular investment is to reduce the amount of shareholders that they have. Then you have Facebook, which take a slightly different approach to, to an investment that they have. So they acquired two big ears of British virtual reality audio company. And to incorporate that company into their operations, they've leased two large office buildings. So you have one, the first example was a re share repurchase program. The second example was in the use of cash that Exxon had. The third one here is the leasing of office buildings, right? Or what in Indiana, rent. The Fiat Chrysler, they spun off the Ferrari luxury uh, unit. So also, so investment decisions are not only those that you make to acquire stuff, it could also be decisions that you need to divest, right? So it's also the other part of it. So here, what they did was to sell the, um, the, the entire unit and they used the money that they ra raised from that spin-off to repay the bank yeah, that they would have had. And then if you go down the line, if we go down the line, then you see other, other cases of, for example, the McDonald's case, uh, they announced plans to sell 2,000 more restaurants in China, and they issued a uh, $1 billion Canadian dollar bond. So a bond, which is slightly different from shares, is, is debt that a company incurs for a fixed period. And normally that bond is repaid at the end of let's say five, 10 years or how, how many years they decide on. And there's also a fixed interest rate, rate for that. So you'll see all different examples here of how those investments were financed. Any questions, any particular one that piques your interest? that you would want me to explain a little bit more. All right, so we can move on. So financing decisions, so you have shareholders are equity investors, so they can contribute to equity financing. And then as I spoke, er, I'll introduce a little earlier, there's also a consideration when you reach the financing decision of what the capital structure will be. So there is a choice between debt and equity. So debt, an example of which I gave you just now was bonds um, are those that have a fixed claim on a company's revenues or income. And then there's equity. So equity shareholders 
are oftentimes the last to be paid when you have uh, when you go into liquidity. So simply because you have to ensure you'll have to sell all your assets, settle all your liabilities, and whatever left is left to the owners. So when you decide on your capital structure, you have to decide how much equity you want, how much debt you want. You'll find that in the early part of your business that Most people would, would ensure that the debt comes a little later. So maybe after three, four years, then there's a claim um, that they have to pay. Then there's equity. So an equity holders are the most exposed because there's no guarantee that you know every year that you're gonna get dividends um, and you might merely have to depend on capital appreciation if you really want your um, returns on the investment that you make. So capital refers to the firm's long-term financing. So we've spoken about, and in this course, we principally focus on the corporation. So you, you, you would appreciate the financial management. You can do it personally as an individual, so a lot of people call it maybe um, wealth management. You can do it as a corporation. So, but, but the course here, the, the focus is more on the corporation. But rest assured that the principles that we, we learn here could also be applied um, to an individual. So corporation is an organized business, uh, is a business organized as a separate legal entity that is owned by shareholders. So there are a couple of things that, a corporation can do maybe everything except vote. So it could borrow money on its own. And in Guyana, it's slightly different. Um, I don't, well, I'm almost sure that all the banks know because of bad experiences that they would not um, lend money to a particular business without the office of the company personally guaranteeing those loans. Um, because in late 90s, there were some horrible stories where Persons knew, knew of the loophole in our in our legal system, and they would borrow money from the banks, and then they would leave the companies to, to run down, and they would go with the bank's money. So what the banks started to, to do around 1997-1998 was to say, whenever companies borrow from from them, then whether it's a director or a shareholder has to personally um. Stand guarantee for that for that loan that is borrowed. All right. So in the US and other countries, they still allow corporations to borrow without getting the owners or an office of the company personally um, guaranteeing that that loan. There are a couple of types of corporations. So there are public companies. Public companies are companies that trade on a stock exchange so you can do it by yourself or go to a broker house and you can obtain shares in those companies in Guyana we have a few public companies who trade on the stock exchange uh, those that I can recall right now include banks GIH, EDL, Demerara Tobacco Company, um, Republic Bank those I can remember off my head but those are public companies that if you can go through a broker and you can get shares in those companies. Then there are private corporations, which are corporation, which are entities that are set up, but they do not trade on a, on a public exchange. Uh, the company on its own decides who can become new shareholders or who cannot. So you have to approach those companies directly uh, before you get holdings in those companies. And then there are limited liability corporations which uh, in, in, in that case, what you invest, um, there's no chance of the veil of incorporation being lifted. And so if the company are in a bad situation that the, the courts or a particular debtor, or sorry, creditor could go after any shareholder or office of that business in case the business goes south. So in that case, the only thing that you can lose is what you would have invested in the company.
So other forms of business organizations, um, they include sole proprietorship, partnerships, corporations, and limited liability. The owner of a corporation are not personally liable for its obligations. And there are a couple of options. So there are limited liability partnerships. And this is particularly popular among um, lawyers and accountants. So who are well generally called, well, are partners in, in that entity. So what the limited liability partnership structure does is that those partners could only lose whatever their shares they would have invested into that company. Or if there is a obligation to be settled, then they, they will only settle in the purport in their proportion. Or even in accounting forms, there's it's a little bit, they've gone a little bit farther, and even in legal forms too. So they will say um, in a limited partnership company, let's say in, I'll give an example in an audit firm, if there are four partners in that firm and one partner is responsible, what you call the engagement partner for the signing of that particular issue, that particular audit opinion. And if it is found that later on that audit opinion was, um, did not reflect the true reality of that business and someone sues the, the company and take them to court and the court determines that the partner was negligent, right? Then that partner would be, that particular partner who would have issued that audit report then becomes liable for whatever um, judgment is made against that partnership. So that's how uh, limited partnership work. Eventually, there's no limited liability companies then the shareholders are only responsible for what they would have invested in that company. And then their professional limited liability companies, um, I'll refer you to the text of that one, because I don't know much about that. Any questions? No questions? No, sir. No, sir. All right. So, this diagram looks at the cash flow, uh, the cash financial management position of a company with the financial manager as that middle person. It's rather simplistic um, demonstration of how it works. The financial manager is in the middle of, of you know, the firm's operations and financial markets. So the firm's op operations where, you know, the production of goods and services go on, financial markets are where he gets um, financing from. Right? So there are a couple of things that, that will happen here. I think it's simplistic because of course the financial manager may have to be reporting to the CEO and then the CEO will have a board because in reality, major capital undertaking or investments are this often decide by the board of directors, right? Who are given those powers by um, shareholders. But some companies might also, based on what we call their um, well, articles of their bylaws. Sorry, based on their bylaws, they will mandate which decisions should come to a general shareholders meeting. So there are different variations to this, but just for simplicity, we put the, we're gonna assume that the financial manager has all the authority or he's received all the approvals, whether it's from the board, board of directors, or from the general um, shareholder at an annual meeting. So what he does is that he will spot an investment opportunity, right? And then he'll go to the markets and say, and raise that funds. So that cash is raised by selling financial assets to investors. So you can do that by doing, by selling shares, offering shares or offering bonds, right? So that cash is then invested in the company's operations and used to purchase real assets. And once those real assets are purchased, then you start your production process, which will then generate cash for the business. Now, once those 
cash is generated, then we have two options. We can either reinvest that cash, which is what we saw in the Exxon Mobil example. So they didn't give back you know, to the investors um, who hold financial assets in their company, that 8.5 billion. We decided to reinvest that. Or you could, the excess funds that originate from your operations, then you can return that to the investor as a dividend. So this is very simplified version of how the finance manager or financial manager will be that intermediary body between a firm's operation and financial market. So go ahead and ask the question. Mr. Sutherland. It was a mistake, sir, sorry. Okay, that's all right. So the financial goal of a corporation so principally, stockholders would want three things. They want to maximize their current wealth. They want to transform that wealth into a desirable pattern of consumption. And then they want to manage risk of that chosen consumption path. So maximizing the wealth is to ensure that the share value, that the shares that they have would be valued at the highest. Right? Then they want to ensure that whenever they want, whenever they have personal consumption needs, that they'll have that dividends being paid to them. And they also want you as the manager to take measures to mitigate, um, or risk management measures to mitigate whatever investments that you take so that their investment can be saved. Right? So they want the most money that they can possibly get. They want that money in a time frame that they would like, um, that will match their personal consumption. And they also want to ensure that the money that they would have invested based on that risk profile of that investment, that measures are taken to safeguard their risk. So they want to safeguard, they want money to spend to match their consumption, and they want the most money that they can possibly have. So those are the, three principal things that stockholders, if you call them shareholders, if you call them equity holders, would want from a corporation. Then not a set of goals. So they want profit maximization. Right. So in theory, once you maximize profits, then you should have a maximum amount of money to return to the shareholders. Right. But it's not, profit maximization is not uh, an objective that is well-defined. So oftentimes we'll go, okay, we wanna maximize profit, but there's no, there's no mention of a time frame. So do you want your profits to be maximized in this current year? Or do you want your profits to be maximized over, four, or over a longer period? And I say this because you might desire profit maximization this year, but in order to get profit maximization, you might have to forego some investments, right? So instead of instead of um, instead of getting a thousand dollars in profits this year, you might say, no, let's invest another. In, in, instead of returning a thousand dollars in profits this year, let's invest five hundred dollars of that in in a new business venture, and then of course the the expenses that you generate from that would um, would not cover back, or even the revenues that you generate from that, or the profits you generate from that might not replace that dollars because it's a new investment and it will build up over time, right? So that will happen in, in, in the short term, or if you're looking at it this year. As against a longer period, if you want a profit maximization for a longer period, you might have to take the decision to ensure that you don't maximize profits this year because there's an opportunity that you can't miss, but whose return will only uh, become to bear fruits in another three, four years. So that's why when, we, when you mentioned profit maximization, the time period is essential. Right? 
So then the second point it goes on to say that companies may increase future profits by cutting current year dip, uh, dividends or investing free up cash in the forums. So, so one of the things that shareholders in maximizing their profits, what they wanna do is to ensure that the returns that they get is the best possible returns that, that is available to them. So in economics, we call it opportunity cost. So let's say, for example, if there is $100 in dividends to be paid to shareholders, but there's also an opportunity to invest that $100, and this is an opportunity for the company to invest that $100 and earn a return of 7%. But from the shareholder's perspective, he could or he or she could invest that money and have a return of 9% then it would be in the best interest of the shareholders to receive that $100 of the dividends and then invest and get 9% than to allow the company to retain that $100, invest it, but only get a return for them of 7%, right? So in, in looking at profit maximization for the shareholders, you will have to look and determine what is the shareholder's best alternative use of the money that he or she but what we're going to do, what I'm going to do, sorry, is put, I'm going to, because remember with the brownie, you have to get water. Or, yeah. So, Lance, that, I mean, I, I know you have other things going on, but could you just mute your mics when you want to carry on those other conversations? I think it's very impolite to your other classmates who are here to learn and trying to focus. Right. So all the financial goals of a corporation, shareholders desire wealth maximization, managers have many constituencies, shareholders, stakeholders. So in running a business, there are many stakeholders. You have employees, you have creditors, you have debtors, you have shareholders, equity holders. And oftentimes it's hard and they all have their own interests. So you would imagine the struggles you will have when employees typically would want to carry home the most money that they can possibly, they possibly could. So once that happens to them, if they have strong union representation or they have strong um, managers who will put forward cases for them, which will make them get significant salary increase for them, of course that is a way into what shareholders or equity holders can have. So there's always these competing interests among stakeholders in, in, a, in a company, which makes it very, very difficult for uh, shareholders wealth maximization to be accomplished. And then, so that's on one stage, and then there's the ever-present agency problems. So once you've done social sciences, agency problems are, we should come across agency problems. Agency problems is one of the cornerstones of social sciences in that you have the, the shareholders who are the owners and then you have the managers who are the agents and oftentimes because the shareholders might be multiple so individually they might not have the clout or, or the power to really effectively manage uh, managers, what end up happening is that the managers are actually the persons who decide what the company does and, that, and not necessarily the shareholders because of the shareholders diversity and, and the way they're set up. It might be hard for them to come together as a collective and really ask managers to manage in their best interest. So what you have is that managers may have things such as expense accounts, uh, you know, they might have a driver who's supposed to, you know, just be driving them, but instead the driver might be taking the kids to school and picking them up. So that extra gas, you know, even over time are expenses that the company will bear. So, and that will also eat into the shareholders' um, returns, which makes their wealth maximization, um, you know, less likely. 
So that's something you should always be um, mindful of. Another source of agency problems is, is that the shareholders often do not have the surveillance mechanisms in place. So they would not know beforehand or even immediately after those types of decisions that managers take that is not in their best interest. So they might wait until the AGM, until they see the financials and then they start asking questions and then they realize, well, you know, something has happened that was not supposed to happen, but they do not have that surveillance system in place to stop those problems from recurring. And then of course, once they would have, if they become more diligent, then they'll have to incur costs. These are the shareholders incur costs to actually surveil or have surveillance on those managers on an ongoing basis. So for them, it becomes an expense, which we call agency costs. So there again, it, it it's into the profits that they can, can actually, or the net profits that they will get from that um, from their investment. So there's an investment trade-off. And here, what we do, so you have an investment in, in a, again, you have the financial manager in the center of this action. So you have an investment in real, in a real project. You have the shareholders who are, who are um, funding that. And then you have the shareholders themselves who have also have investment opportunities. So shareholders now can, through the finance manager, use some of their, um, their money, keep it in the business, or they can take the money out of the business to invest in their own um, opportunities that they see. So here they can inject cash into the business. Once the returns are ascertained, then there's an alternative to, and this is the, the finance manager, to pay dividends to shareholders. And once he would have done pay that dividends to shareholders, then shareholders could invest for themselves. So this diagram essentially shows you the investment um, trade-off. Again, the finance manager is at the center of this. He would, of this simplified um, figure, he would look at investment opportunities, ask for cash from shareholders. Once at the end of a particular period, then he will decide whether or not he pay dividends to the shareholders. And if he has done that, then the shareholders decide what to do with their money. Do they invest in, um, in, in other companies or do they consume what they have or save? So just to conclude on the financial goals of a corporation, there's the investment trade-off. So one of the critical things in the investment trade-off is what we call the hurdle rate. So the hurdle rate is the cost of capital, right? Which you will be introduced to into the next, uh, in the next, lecture. So it's the minimum acceptable rate of return on an investment. So once you go to shareholders or even a debt holder or, or a bond holder, a debt holder, and you ask them to invest in, in, in an opportunity, investment opportunity that you have, there's that minimum rate that they will set. Um, in, our, in our case, it might be rate. So they will look at the bank rates and say, well, okay, well, not like the bank offering any, any interest rates these days. I think it's less, far less than 1% these days. But they will say, um, you know, they'll set that for the rate at say, maybe 3 5% and say, look, once this investment um, cannot give me this return, then there's no use in me investing in that particular opportunity. Then there's the opportunity cost of capital is investment in the project eliminates the other opportunity to invest, um, to use that particular cash. So what you're saying here, the opportunity cost of capital for those who would have, who have done economics, which I think is a prerequisite course before you can do financial management, then you recognize that the opportunity cost is the best possible alternative um, that you can use your money to get returns from. Okay. So just a little dip, a deeper dive into agency problems. 
So the question is asked, do managers maximize shareholders' wealth or managers? Right. Some of the examples that I gave you just now because of the, uh, the diversity and the thin spread of shareholders, then oftentimes managers get away with doing things that are more self-serving than those of maximizing the wealth of the investors, which are the shareholders. Again, managers have many constituencies who are all competing for, in, in our case, um, that those profits that you make for a year uh, will decide depending on the you know, political influence that they'll have, how much of that stake that they'll be. And essentially a stakeholder is anyone who has a financial interest in a corporation. So they can include um, creditors, they can include banks, employees. Um, in our case, the mayor, city council, who you're supposed to pay or income taxes to, uh, GRA, who you're supposed to pay, you know, corporation taxes to, and NIS, who is supposed to pay social security to. So they are all stakeholders. So one, there's an entity that, or an individual that has a legitimate financial claim to a company's profits, then they're all considered stakeholders. Just a little bit more explanation of the agency problem. You see managers are agents of the equity holders and are tempted to act in their own interest rather than maximizing the shares. And again, any cost that stockholders, equity holders, shareholders incur uh, to maintain surveillance on those managers is what we call agency cost. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Sir, would you be sharing your slides? Still, the slides have already been shared on Edmodo. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wasn't aware. Thank you. We've loaded it. Um, so it's there. So to tackle the agency problem, one of the things that companies have put in place is what we call corporate governance. So corporate governance has several structures. So they can start as low as the policies, the ways of working, the procedures that companies and supervisors will put in place, and it can run to checks and balances that the board of um, directors could put in place, the shareholders could put in place, and even the laws and regulations that will be in place. So there's several strategies of corporate governance, which which remedy the issue of the agency problem so that a company could run for its in intended purpose of value maximization for its owners. All right, so we can take a break now. Hi, good night, sir. All right, so the second part of the lecture, I introduce you to financial statements. For those who've done accounting before, it would be a walk in the park for those who haven't, you shouldn't get worried. Uh, I know last year, it was a bit shocking that not everybody in financial management would have done accounting course before. But financial management deals with a lot of numbers. So again, you need to be come comfortable with numbers and you should know where the figures come from in a financial statement. So the financial statements that I present to you will be very sim um, simple. In the real world, when you at work, uh, whether you're the CEO, then you will have someone like a CFO or financial manager to do those um, analysis for you, run those numbers for you, um, but you should have knowledge of where those numbers come from, how they relate. So financial statements are principally, and this is the technical accounting um, standards definition. So accounting sta uh, financial statements these days are made up of balance sheets, 
but for those who come from from the rigid up to date accounting um, background then is what they call now the statement of financial position then there's the income statement which they call the statement of comprehensive statement of financial performance there's the statement of comprehensive income statement so the income statement covers the economic the normal economic activity the of comprehensive income will cover in addition to what is a normal economic activity it would cover those one off um, transactions that you can do such as disposal of a segment of the company um, it would also look at things that whether or not you've paid things such as dividends then there's the statement of equity which looks at the movement in in a in the equity in a company so the equity of a company is essentially the the claim that the owners of the company will have so that will include things such as retained earnings um, it will also account for things that we have paid out like dividends so it shows the whole movement and it will also include their current year profits so that's a statement of equity then there's the cash flow statement which looks at um, which is a reconciliation of your profits for the year to the cash balance. So you'll have things such as um, cash flow from operations, um, cash flow from investing, and cash flow from financing. So that's a cash flow statement. And then the notes of the accounts are also considered part of the financial statement. So as a matter of fact, they refer to, they say in the accounting, the accountant will say it's an integral part of the financial statements because in those notes you'll find an explanation of some of the numbers that you have had the basis of which those numbers were calculated and also they might have they will have some disclosures which should be taken into account when the analysis of those finance, uh, financial statements are done so the financial statement show the position. So that's a balance sheet, the performance, which is the income statement, movement in cash flow, which occurs in the statement, and the movement in equity, which is regarded in the equity statement. And they are, which are, and those are the major things that you take into consideration when you look at the financial statement. So why do you need to understand financial statements as whether or not you're strong in finance or you just um, supervising finance or you're working alongside finance. So you need to focus on its preparation, right? Oftentimes it's a key source of financial, it's a key source of information on which financial decisions are made. So whether they want to acquire a company, whether or not you want to invest in a company, oftentimes you always ask for you know the financial statements could i have a look at the financial statements could i look have a look at the audited financial statements because you tend to place more value or more uh, or you feel more secure using audited financial statements so that you can make decisions on whether or not to invest in a company or you know even do business with a company right so you need to also understand that the financial statements that are presented to you do not in its entirety reflect the market values of that company. So for instance, if a, in, in a company would have purchased real assets, fixed assets, tangible assets, they would, would have bought those assets at a particular value. And that is kept in the company at what we call historic value less whatever depreciation would have charged in that but the actual market value might be different so if you go to get dispose of that asset it might be less than what is actually on the books or it might even be more in some cases um, so it's critical for you to understand that what is shown on the books is not necessarily um, what is the value of that so you will purchase or investors will purchase uh, shares from you at let's say $100 a share. 
And in your books, you will continue to value that equity at $100 per share. But the market value of that share would have changed over time. So it could appreciate, it could depreciate, um, depending on how the market sees that particular company. So always bear in mind um, that the accounting value and the market values are different. And then you should also know and understand that there's a difference between income and cash flow. Again, we go back to the we go back to the example of depreciation. So once you'd have bought an asset, you would have paid right for that asset, and that would be a cash flow. But in terms of an accounting, from an accounting perspective, um, or from an income perspective, in your financials, you first treat that as an asset, and then you'll depreciate it over a particular time. So you will find that, that let's say for a company that uh, generates a revenue of a thousand, and let's say you would have invested uh, in a particular equipment that cost another thousand, right? And then we said, say, depreciate that over five years, so you have depreciation of 200. So you'll have a revenue coming in of a thousand, but the only amount of expense that you will recognize in that particular year is that depreciation of, uh, of 200. So you will have a profit in that year, just a simplified example of $80. But if you look at the cash perspective from it, you would have had income of a thousand, but you would have bought an equipment for a thousand dollars. So you could have zero cash on hand in this very simple example, but you have a profit of $800. Mustafa, you have a question, you can go ahead. No, sir, mistake, sorry. All right, good. So, so that's the difference between uh, income and cash. So you can have terrific um, income based on your accounting policies, um, but you could have no cash. Another example is that you could, you could sell on credit. So you sell on credit, um, you record revenue of let's say $1,000, but then you also record a debt of $1,000, right? Let's say you have no other transaction that year. And, and let's say for that sale, um, the cost of sales, let's say was just $600. So you end up with a profit of $400. But in fact, you've got, you haven't gotten any cash as yet because you've sold all of that on credit. So you should always bear in mind that income and cash is not the same thing, most times. So let's look at the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is a snapshot of the financial position of a firm taken at the time. Generally, in Guyana, we, we look at our balance sheets once a year. In the US, for companies who trade on the stock exchange, then they're required, based on the rules of the stock exchange, to publish their, uh, I might be lost too, to publish their financials once per quarter. So at least once per quarter that they'll, they'll have a look at that balance sheet, which is, which is the financial position. Um, for internal purposes, companies with some companies will do monthly um, financial reports. So they'll have a chance to look at, you know, the balance sheet every month. So balance sheet is what's happened at a particular time or what is happening at a particular time. It's just, you take a picture of, of, of your debtors, uh, of the assets your liabilities and your equity at that particular point in time, right? So it summarizes what you own, what is assets, what you owe, liabilities, and the difference between those two are equity, are equity interests, which relates to what the owners have. Um, after all, assets would have been used to, to settle all liabilities, right? When we look at the picture on the right, it introduces um, a concept of networking capital, which is the difference between your current assets and your current liabilities. In looking at this picture, if we could look at proportionality, then we could say that the current assets are more than the current liabilities. So we can safely say that if we 
um, liquidate our current assets, we'll be able to settle all of our current liabilities and even some of our long-term debt, but not all. So in, in order to liquidate that long-term debt, then we need to use our assets to generate more income, or if it's a case of winding up a company, then you need to sell those assets to settle those debt. And then what is left belongs to the shareholders. So this is a very simplified version of a, a, a balance sheet. So you have assets on one side. Assets are divided into two classes, current assets and fixed assets. So current assets are typically assets that are, are that will that are 12 months or less, or we be settled in 12 months or less, or you liquidate or you or that transaction will manifest in 12 months or less. And then fixed assets are assets that will last over a longer time and are, are those productive assets that will help to, to produce goods and services. Then you have liabilities, current liabilities. These are liabilities that you're expected to settle in less than 12 years. Or if you get more technical in a normal course of business. So normal course of business for some companies could be 18 months. And then their long-term debt, which are debt that you expect to settle um, in, in, more, in a term that is more than 12 months. And then the equity hold, uh, shareholders equity, which relates to retain profits, profits for the year, um, you know, share. So a couple of key terms on a, on a balance sheet that you should acquaint yourself with, so assets, it's what we own. So in addition to, well, just now I call it fixed assets, but it could also be referred to as non-current assets. And those assets could also be tangible and intangible. You have liabilities, which are what we owe, and those could be current or non-current. Then you have bonds, which are long-term debt. So bonds, as I said earlier in the lecture, are financing that you, you receive from, from entities or individual that are normally of a period that is more than one year and they have some fixed terms on which those bonds will be repaid. So both the amount that you would have received from those um, investors and the interest that would have been paid on that. So some bonds will ask for, um, you know, yearly interest and then the, then the capital portion is paid off at a particular date or some would allow you to pay the capital and the, and the accumulated interest at that particular date. So some bonds might be five years, 10 years. So bondholders are long-term creditors. The audit creditors and businesses are, which we are classified as current liabilities are those that you do normal trading with. So whether you purchase um, items on credit, then you refer to them as creditors. Then they also have um, a shareholder, shareholders equity, which is equal to, which is sometimes referred to as common equity or owner's equity. The balance sheet has what we call an identity, identity statement or some call it the um, the equation, the balance sheet, balance sheet equation. So at the end of the day, assets will always equal to liabilities plus equity, right? And of course we could interchange um, the subject of the formula to find either of the other. Sir, what's common equity? Common equity is same as owner's equity. So if you, is the money that shareholders um, invest in a business in its in its um, initial stage, but is also retained profits in later years. So that's owner's equity. Oh, so okay. Business, so the shareholders will start a business that say they invest a thousand dollars. So that's their claim to the business, and then at, let's say at the end of the first year of the business, um, the retain profits in the business, let's say it's another $300, then the, their equity will move, will include what they invested and the retained earnings. So that will move from a thousand to 1300. Okay. That owner's equity 
um, could be reduced by the dividends paid in, in one instance. And of course, if a company made a loss in a particular year, then it will reduce that shareholders equity or owners equity or common equity. They're all the same. And there's networking capital, which is current assets minus current liabilities. It's a good signal when your current assets could is more than your current liabilities. It, it says that for the foreseeable future, or at least another year, if you liquidate all your assets, then you'll be able to set all your current assets, you'll be able to settle all your current liabilities, right? So it's uh, one of the initial uh, measures of the health of a company. So if you have a positive working capital, it's a good signal for most businesses, but for businesses that sell on, on um, let's say like a, a cash on cash terms, then you'll expect that they wouldn't have significant debtors. So you might find those businesses might not have a positive working capital, especially if they focus and maintain very slim inventories, right? So some of the things that are included in current assets are inventory, debtors, cash, and if you would have prepared any expense. So if you would have prepared, well, don't prepare GPL. If you would have prepared, prepared things like insurance, um, those are considered current assets. So liquidity is the speed and ease at which an asset can be converted to cash. So when you say a company is very liquid, um, it's how it's the period of time that it will take to move that inventory and realize cash and how easy it is to do that. Right? How easy it is to get your money. So you have debtors on your books. So how easy it is or, or, or the period that they will take to um, settle those debt. Most times company will give you um, a period, maybe 30 or 45 days depending on the industry you're in, or even two weeks, to settle those debts. So liquidity is measured, is two variables here, the speed at which it, it happens, and then how easy is it for, for that to happen, right? You can recognize that some debt um, or inventory would not be easy to, um, to convert to cash. So there's also, Two other aspects of liquidity, so the ease of conversion versus loss of value. So you could have assets that are challenging to convert, current assets that are challenging to convert to cash at its market value. But if you give discounts, then of course, there might be someone who would be willing to take it off your hands very, very easily. So you should also consider, um, you know, the ease of conversion versus the loss of value. Right. So that's why one, some companies like, especially the beverage companies will have things such as happy hours. So they will know then, well, there's a drive that you can get more, you can get more revenue by reducing the profits. Um, so that's why you, you probably hear, you know, Guinness get a happy hour or whatever beer, Stag get a happy hour. You, I don't know how much beer is for a thousand, but then the, 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 the trade-off that is ma they're making is that if we keep it at a particular price, then it can take longer to convert the cash. But if we drop the price, we will make smaller profit margins, but you could have that liquidity going, right? So it's more a focus now on volume instead of profit, which again here, points back why, why it is challenging for a company to focus always on profit maximization. Because oftentimes you need a cash in hand to set the bills. So do you sit and wait another two weeks to get a, you know, 100 cases of Guinness sold? Or do you cut the, the profits and get it sold in, you know, over a weekend, right? So that's why profit maximization is not always feasible. 
or you can you just can't wait at the time. Hi, sir. An example of this could it be like the Black Friday and Cyber Monday sale that they have annually? Excellent example, right? Because some companies recognize that with um, with the seasons changing, so Black Friday, Cyber Monday, deep into fall, um, you might have a particular taste for fashion. So you know when spring reach next year, then nobody not wearing that. So yes, companies instead of trying to maximize, then they will just try to get um, the liquidity in hand. So they will reduce um, the prices that they charge. And there you go, you have the money. So that's an excellent example. Good. So when we when we respond to when we refer to liquid assets, uh, are assets that are easily um, converted without any significant loss of value, and when we refer to illiquid assets as those assets that are hard to convert to cash without a significant price reduction. So debt versus equity. So debt is the amount of money borrowed by one party from another. Again, this will have some terms and conditions on it. So that could be a loan at the bank, that could be bondholders or, or bonds that you would have taken. Equity represents the value that would be returned to company shareholders if all the assets were liquidated. So again, if you have, you have fixed assets and current assets, if the company is to, to, to wind up, then once you will dispose of that with current assets and, and fix or dispose of the fixed assets and realize the cash from those current assets, then you use that to settle all the debt. What is left is equity in the company. So just to introduce financial leverage in this company. So the use of debt in a firm's capital structures we call financial leverage. So when we go to the next lecture, you'll see there's a ratio that we calculate, we call debt to equity. So the higher, so it's debt upon equity. So the higher debt you have um, when compared to equity is what we call to, what, what we refer to as a um, heavily financial leveraged company. Um, but we'll go more into that and we'll explain a little bit when you see the numbers, see where they come from. So once you use debt, it has a magnifying effect on both your profits and losses. Right. We'll explain more of that. Just take it as it is now. Don't want to, I know I'm imparting a lot tonight. Don't want to give you more. So you'll get to that. We'll explain that a little bit more when we go, go through the ratios. So there's Market value versus book value. So market value is the true value of an asset. And that's the, that's the value of asset that you will get um, from selling an asset in an arm's length transaction. So this is no party. These are two parties or several parties. One buying, one selling in an open market where information is freely available to both parties then the value that is um, realized would be the true value of that particular asset. And then book values are those which are shown in the firm's um, balance sheet. So they tell them have any relationship to uh, market value, especially if those values are on the balance sheet for quite a long time. Typical example, fixed assets. Because fixed assets are held for a long time, then the longer they're held, it's more um, farther they go from their market value. In terms of current assets, it's a little bit, um, the disparity between book value and, and market value is a little less because you would imagine that in a, if a transaction is settled less than a year compared to a transaction that's five year old, then market and the market forces at play uh, will be very different to what is regarded as a book value. So we go to the income statement, and this is a very um, simplified income statement. The students in my class last year would have been introduced to 
one that was very comprehensive but on reflection i think um, it's probably unnecessary for me to share that um, but here we an income statement looks at the company's performance over a particular period so it could be a year a quarter every month um, but some of the key elements of an income statement you have net sales so net sales is sales as any discounts um, and any returns then you have cost of sales um, which is the cost that you can easily trace um, and feasibly trace to the sales that you have made and those are normally um, direct costs you less that from the net sales you get gross profit and then from the gross profit once you less what we term general and admin expenses you end up with profit before interest and tax you less interest you get the taxable profit and you less tax you get profit after tax um, just open question if you pay if you were to pay dividends which of the figures you think um, the dividends would be based on which are the profits anyone could answer profit after tax any other suggestions answers right so that's correct um dividends are normally are normally decided on or recommended to the board the shareholders who has the final which one has which one who has the final um uh, authority to make the decision based on the profit after tax. So there are a couple of key features in income statements. So it includes both cash and non-cash items. Again, open question to the class, which might be a non-cash item that would be included in, a, in the income statement. A bond in the income statement. No, so this is so in the so the, the question is that oh, the statement is that an income statement will have both cash items and non cash items in determining the profit after tax. So which one might be an example of a non a non cash item that will be included in the income statement? Depreciation. So it's something that's included in the income statement, but that you don't actually pay cash for, or you don't disburse cash. Would that be discount, sir? Discount? Can I have another example? All right, the typical example that we'll have is depreciation. Right. So depreciation, you don't, you, don't, you don't disburse funds to depreciation, but depreciation will be included somewhere here in general and admin expenses. Again, in the income statement, you could have um, included in the net sales figure, you could have sales on credit which is a non-cash item. I mean, if you haven't received it as yet, then there's no cash. Right. Likewise, you could have... Go ahead, Nandi. That would be an example of an interest paid. So interest paid would be, that would be on like, like the bonds, right? So that'd be interest paid. Or if you have a loan at the bank, that's where interest paid goes. But that's actual disbursement of money. All right. So that will come here um, after what they call PBIT. Right. You have interest paid and then which you, you come to a taxable profit, then whatever the tax code is, you pay your taxes. Bad debt written off, sir. Bad debt written off also is not the uh, right. It's not a cash item, but yeah, that's a non-cash item that would be included in, in the statement.
Good. So included in, in the income statement is also fixed and variable costs. So could, I, could anyone think of what might be a fixed cost? Rent. Rent. Right. And then variable costs is so many on. You also, you also um, in the income statement, cost could also be uh, classified as product cost and period cost. So product cost could include raw materials, direct, direct um, labor costs, manufacturing overhead, and period costs would include selling general and administrative expenses. Great. So another feature of the income statement is taxes. So taxes is a charge levied by a legal, a legal authority on your profits. In our case, it's the Ghana Revenue Authority. Um, so just to be clear, uh, there are there are other taxes like environmental taxes, but they will they would they will not go um, on what you call a taxable profits. Those environmental taxes are often tied to. Uh, in, in a case, might be, I know for those who sell drinks, sweet drinks, a per bottle and or so forth. So that would be more classified as a a um, general and administrative <coughs> expense, right? Um, the rates and taxes that you pay to, to city council, that'll be classified <coughs> as general and administrative expenses. The taxes we refer to here is the taxes that um, are paid to, uh, in, in our case, the GRA, in the US, I think, in the IRA, or IRS, sorry. Good, so then there are income tax rates. So there are two types of income, um, when you think about it, there are two rates of taxes or two classification rates of taxes. So there's an average tax rate, which is the total taxes you pay divided by the taxable income. And then there's a marginal tax rate. So the marginal tax rate is the tax rate that you pay or the taxes you, the marginal tax rate is the rate of tax you pay on additional on an additional dollar of revenue that you earn based on your current position. So if we look at um, the table at the bottom of the right. So if you have income of four to 5,000, right? That is taxed at 15%, right? If you go to, so if you go up from four to 5,100, up to 17,000, 70,000, then you pay 25%. So if you have an earning of four to 5,000, you say your marginal tax rate going forward. So that is every dollar earned over four to 5,000 would be 25% um, once it's less than 70,000. Is that clear? Um, please go to part over again, sir. So if our current taxable income is four to five thousand, right? Our marginal tax rate based on based on this table here, right? So we have right, let me make it original. Let me move this and make it a little clear. So let's start over. So the, the top table shows the the various bands and the tax rates. If you earn zero to 50,000, you pay 50%. If you earn 51, uh, $50,101 to 75,000, you pay 25%. And you follow the, so these are the bands and these are the rates. So if in, in a real situation, you earn four to $5,000, then you'll pay in this band, the zero to 50. So that'll be 15%, right? If you earn, anything between or over four to 5,000, but less than 50,000, 
your marginal tax rate will still remain 50,000 because every dollar you earn over that four to 5,000, but less than 50,000, but up to 50,000, they still be charged at 15%. But let's say you go over that um, $50,000. Let's say your taxable income was $50,000. So every dollar that you earn over $50,000 will now be charged at 25%. Um, percent. So your marginal tax rate then will be will be 25%. So every dollar you earn up to 70,000 will be at 25%. So it's in, in, in simpler sense, you look at the bonds and depending on where you are and the rate of tax that is applied to the additional dollar, that will be your marginal tax rate. <coughs> Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So you, you'll find that you'll find that most times the average tax rate and the marginal tax rate will differ. Depends on the and it also depends on the tax code that is in place in the country. Sir, I have a question. Hmm? So it means that, yeah, so um, even if you earn 50,000, you will only tax four to 5,000? The taxable income is what is left, right? That is available to be taxed, <laughs> right? So if you are, so if your taxable income becomes 50,000, then you tax, your 50,000 will be taxed. If your taxable income is 90,000, then 90,000 will be taxed. Just remember that. So taxable income is this figure that we're referring to. What we call taxable profit here. So this is the figure that we refer to. In financial, in financial management, the critical one to take into account is marginal tax rate. Because once you would have, once you would have incurred um, some costs is what we call sunk. So if you're time one, but between time zero and time one, you would have been invested uh, or spent, incurred some expenses going forward and you have earned some revenue going forward is those cash flows that would, from a financial management perspective, going forward is those additional cash flows that you will you will earn, is what is taken into account, and that will be, which will also be the marginal tax rate of everything that you earn. That's what what is taken into account. So what happens before is, uh, not totally forgotten about, but is what is considered um, some cost, something that you can change. So. It's no, um, it's, it's of little use to take that into consideration when you're going forward in, in an investment decision. You could go ahead, Ms. Bacos. Good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. All right, so marginal tax rate is the same as the actual tax rate. Not necessarily. Marginal tax rate is the is the tax you will pay on every additional. Say you are at $250,000, right? So you at $250,000. At $250,000, you will be in this band here between, between um, 100,000 and, 100, and $1 and 335,000. You'll pay 39%, right? So that will be, so everything you earn over this 250 up to 335 will be taxed at 39%. At but let's say you're at uh, $335,000. So 
So at $335,000, your tax rate is 39%. But the minute you earn a dollar more, it becomes 34%. So your marginal tax rate, if your current earnings is $335,000, will be the next band that you will go to, which is 34%. So for practical purposes, let's consider that your current earnings is 335,000. If you earn 10,000 more, that 10,000 more will be taxed at 35, 34%. So that would be a marginal tax rate. So as a matter of fact, you could earn up to another 665,000 and a marginal tax rate will be 34%. Sir, minute two, I think what everybody yeah, trying to say is that, that, that 335, right? That 335, mm -hmm. Current thirty five thousand that will still be right. taxed at thirty nine percent, and the extra ten thousand yeah. extra dollar will be taxed at thirty four. Correct. Okay, that's correct. Um, Everybody yeah. understand what you're answering? Yes, yes, sir. That is along right. the line that I was but that's thinking. Totally correct, sir. Because um, the pay usually when you have to calculate pay or the um, tax for GRA, you do it similar to that with 28% for within the um, the tax threshold and then the 40%. So I was just wondering if it's the same way that we would have to do. Um, <coughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. So we got a cash flows. And cash is king, so it's a statement you hear throughout your financial life. So it doesn't matter how the income statement looks. If you don't have cash in hand, then you know not much is happening. So for this course, when we say cash flow, it's the difference between the dollars you receive and the dollars you pay out, right? So that's just when when you hear cash flow in this particular course. Um, it's the dollars you receive in versus um, the dollars you receive out. So it's the net of that. So there are a couple, when you look at the cash flow statement, it is categorized in a couple of, of um, big areas. So you have operating cash flow, which is the results from the primary day to day activities of the company. And then there's uh, capital invest uh, spending which they call cash flow from investments. So it's a net spending on the assets that you require, less the assets that you dispose. And then you look at the change in networking capital. So remember networking capital is current assets less current liabilities. So you will look at um, the change. So you look at the opening. So it's the closing less the opening. Um, networking capital positions. So you, you put all that together and that will be um, the cash flow statement, all right? So again, in the cash flow statement, you have three big categories. So you have cash flow from operations. So that's the cash that you actually get from your day-to-day -day activities. Then you have capital spending, which we call cash flows from investments. So we invest in fixed assets. So that looks at, uh, the next net spent between what you purchase and what you disposed of. And then there's change in working cap um, net working capital. So you look at the working capital at the end of the year compared to the working capital at the beginning of the year. So if we look at, so I can't flip between the two um, screens, but if you look, um, the income statement that I provided on slide 31. <coughs> on slide 31, we had profit before tax of 13,000. To reconcile back to the operating cash flow, then you have to add back things like depreciation because you, you would have taken out depreciation um, from that figure, but depreciation is not a a real charge is not a cash flow. And then you have added back interest charges simply because the interest charges are classified as 
financing, right? So you will take a loan from the bank, um, you pay interest charges on that. So that will go into the financing part of the cash flow statement. And then less taxes, simply because taxes are, are, are what you actually paid. And that will give you cash flow from operations. So this is a reconciliation from the profit before interest and tax. Um, this brings you to cash flow from operations. So these are the simple um, adjustments that you make if you're given the income statement that I give you, and that will determine how much cash you actually got from operations. So this $14,000 would be hard cash that you would have earned. Any questions? So I have a question about equity earlier. Okay, go ahead. Um, remember you were saying that equity represents the value returned to a company. So um, could you return it in the form of an asset and not as cash? So equity is what is left in a company after you would have taken all your assets and settled all your liability. Right, so that's the final, that's the final um, state that, that the equity holders, the shareholders, will have in a company. But then, and if you, it's it's a possibility because I mean, in, in, in business, there are many things that could be, could happen. It's not only cash that is ex, um, is exchanged that is exchanged um, between equity holders and um, and, and companies. There's still things like barter that happen in the world today. So of course it depends on the on the preference of a particular equity holder if they want a particular asset as consideration for the investment. And surely, yeah. So there's nothing that is eliminated um, when you're doing business. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So it, it just comes up to the preference and what the uh, what the equity holder prefers. And once there's an agreement, then fine. Okay. So then we have cash spending, which we call the um, cash flow from investments. So what I've do done is, is brought in a snapshot of well, a financial a balance sheet. A simplified one. So you're given the above um, simplified balance sheet. Additionally, you're told that depreciation for 2016 was $65. Calculate the net capital spending. So the way we do it is that at the end of 2015, we know that fixed assets was 1644 During 2016, we charge depreciation of six to five. So if we would have um, not buy anything, it would have been the fixed assets at the end of the year, at the end of 2016, would have been the balance at the start, less the depreciation for the year, which would have been 15, five, seven to nine. However, in 2016, this is what we ended up with, a balance of 1,709. So by deduction, then the investment must have been $130, which is the balance at the end of the year, less the net book value in the year. Sir, go over that, please. Yeah, my. So we're trying to determine what was the investment in fixed assets, right? Or what we call a capital spend. We're given three bits of information. So we know in 2015, the closing balance for fixed assets was 1,644. So remember the closing balance in one year is the opening balance in the next year, right? You with me? Yeah. Good. At the end of 2016, we had a balance of $1,709 representing net fixed assets. So we want to find the movement between 
this figure, 1644 and 1709, right? And that the movement in that figure represents what is the net um, capital spending or what we call the net um, investment in cash, uh, cash flow in investment. So we take the ending balance of 2015, which is the beginning balance of 2016, which was 1644. And we know that we charge depreciation of six to five during the year. See, if we had not done anything, we know the balance at the end of the year should have been 1579, which is the balance at the start of the year less the depreciation, right? But we found that the balance at the end of the year was actually 1709. So by deduction, we will know that we would have invested or, or had a net investment of $130. Question, sir. So, if the depreciation was not specified at the in the the dialogue at the bottom there, we would have just did the simple subtraction. Yeah, but that would not be incorrect. Then, if they don't give the depreciation, then something is wrong. They have to give the depreciation because you would expect that every fix you would expect that the fixed assets that you have will depreciate. I understand. Right. So they will give you the depreciation charge. Well, at least if I give you a question, I will tell you what's the depreciation charge here. But so in an exam, well, not that I will give you that in an exam, but for those who are um, doing accounting and accounting as a major, they will know that the, in a question, they will get both the balance sheet and the income statement. And the income statement will have the depreciation so they will not be given, they might not be given this note. So they will just be given a balance sheet and an income statement, and then they will have to go and extract the depreciation from the in income statement to make sense and come back to the figure. But I wouldn't give you that. Just... If I ever give you it, then I'll give you exactly like I gave you this. Any more clarifications, questions? All right, so this is where we are. This is another way of doing it. So we could have taken the ending balance, less the beginning balance and add back the depreciation, we will get the same one thirty. So whichever way uh, makes better sense to you, you can use any, any, any of the two logics. Any questions before I move on? All right. So now we look at change in net working capital. So again, I present back the balance sheet and we're asked to calculate the change in net working capital. So we look at, remember net working capital is the difference between the current assets one year and the current liabilities in another year. So we always start with the current year and we list the previous year. So in the current year, 2016, we have net working capital. We've worked that out to be 1014. That's because we had total current assets in 2016 of 1,403, and we had total current liabilities of 39, of 389. So if we less 389 from $1,403, then we have net working capital in 2016 of $1,014, right? But we want to know the change in it. Remember we said that the closing in one year is the opening of the previous year. So the closing in 2015, we had current assets of 1,112, less current liabilities of 428. So that will give you net working capital of 684. Right. 
So if we want to know the net for the year would be 1014 less 684. It would be, sorry, it would be, it would be 12, I'm um, sorry, it would be $1,112 less $428 that will give you the working capital for um, the beginning working capital. So then the net movement would be the difference between the ending in 2016, which was 1014, and the beginning, which was 684. So the net change would be 336. 330, sorry. That's how you calculate the net change. So you calculate the net change for both years, and then you do the subtraction. Current year less previous year. Any questions? Any questions? Sir, good night. The working for this sheet will be placed on Excel, right? Um, no, I haven't put this one on Excel. This one is just as it is here. There's not much calculation, so you are for this one. All right, Grace? Okay, sir. So a question to you now, if the change in working capital is $330, is this a good thing or a bad thing? So the end in working capital is 1,014 and, and that's net working capital, right? And the beginning was 684. So at the end of the year, you had a change of 330. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. A good thing. So why, why is it a good thing? Because the capital was more than the liability. The assets were more than the liabilities. So remember cash is king, right? So now you have more, you have more cash now to do what you want to do. So indeed it's a good thing. All right. So just to recap, um, and this is a recap for the first um, bit of the lecture. So we know that book values on the balance sheet can vary greatly with market values. We know that the goal of financial management is to maximize the share market value and not the book value. Right? Uh, we maximize the share market value because that's what that's the thing that the or that's the financial instrument that equity holders would use and and um, in, in, their, in their cases, disposed to recover their um, investment. So you want to maximize that. Right? You know that the marginal and average tax rates can be different. Um, marginal tax rate is relevant for most financial decisions because when you make financial decisions, you look forward. So what is done is done. Um, so what you concentrate on is what will be a marginal tax rate. So like the balance sheet, the cash flow also has a equation or identity, or identity statement. So which is um, cash flow from assets is equal to cash flow to creditors. And shareholders. If the lecture. We still have a couple of questions to go through before we say good night. Um, so I'll